Commissioner Gavidia. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Grimmick. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Hisserick. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Cotto. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Kalfani. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Lemos. Not present. Commissioner Mandel. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Ossie and Commissioner Pack uh, will not be attending tonight. Commissioner Shannon. Present. Thank you. And Commissioner Sorota. Present. Thank you. Great. Eight members and a quorum, Mr. President. Um, thank you for that. Uh, going to... Uh, Neighborhood councils. Is there anybody in the queue from neighborhood councils? Currently, there is no one in queue. Excellent. I'm going to public comment. Is there anybody in public comment? There is not. Can and we then have? Can we then have a, 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 a approval, please, for the last minutes? May I have uh, somebody to approve that? I'll, I'll, I'll move to approve. I'll, I'll second. That was uh, Sorota to move and Grimmick to second? No. Yes, no. Yes. Other way around. Yeah, ah. Grim Grimmick to approve and Hisserick to, and also Sorota to uh, second. Okay. Thank you. And let me call for approval of that. Commissioner Gavidia. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Grimmick. Aye. And Commissioner Hisrick? Aye. Commissioner Cato? I, I have. Oh, I approve. Thank you. Commissioner Clafani? Approve. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mandel? Approve. And Commissioner Shannon? Approve. And Commissioner Sorota? Approve. Thank you, and those minutes are approved. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Moving on to the next agenda item, um, it's uh, a great honor to uh, present a leading expert uh, on neural vulnerability factors that predict uh, future weight gain. Uh, Professor Eric uh, Seiss is uh, both a professor of the Department of Psychiatry as well as Behavioral Science uh, at Stanford uh, University, and uh, we're honored and thrilled that you would Virtually join us uh, from Northern California uh, with your, your education, experience, and expertise. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll jump into the sharing screen bit and just launch this. Uh, hopefully, you can see and hear everything. Uh, so I'm going to. Talk today uh, about neural vulnerability factors that predict weight gain and uh, translation of some of these ideas and the interventions that we're beginning to evaluate to kind of promote a healthier body weight. Um, uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health have supported this research. Um, so obesity, uh, as I suspect everybody knows, is a, a second leading cause of premature death in Western countries. But unfortunately, in the frontline treatment behavioral weight loss programs don't really produce lasting weight loss for most individuals. Uh, pretty much 90% of people regain the, the weight that they lose within about a two year period of time. So um, we're hoping that an improved understanding of the neural vulnerability factors that predict unhealthy weight gain may reveal intervention targets that allow us to create more effective obesity prevention programs and treatments. Uh, the bottom line is we need a, a better solution to this public health program problem. Um, you know, to put it in kind of simple terms, on average, obesity will shorten somebody's life uh, by seven years. So it's a really significant uh, decrease in productivity and life quality and stuff like that. So it's, it's very important. Um, and at present, 70% um, of people in the United States are obese or overweight. So it really affects a lot of people. It's a really significant issue. Um, so I was going to describe an etiologic model called the dynamic vulnerability model of obesity that serves as a heuristic for some of the work we've done. Describe high-risk, prospective, and repeated measure studies to capture uh, some effects that are consistent with the, this ideologic model. 
and then discuss neural intervention targets that we identified through this program of research that we could, um, you know, basically address with prevention programs and treatment. And I'll describe one intervention that has shown efficacy in reducing uh, body weight uh, of, of the ones, the, the neural risk factors that we've identified. Um, so when people taste high calorie foods, it activates uh, reward regions. Um, I'm not going to get into the brain parts. You can read them on the screens. Um, but uh, these tastes of high calorie foods also cause dopamine signaling and reward circuitry. Um, so it's, it's really effective at activating our reward circuitry. Here's a picture of your brain on chocolate milkshake. Uh, we give people chocolate milkshake in the scanner and basically look at what regions are recruited as people taste these chocolate milkshakes. And this, this slide has always impressed me because it shows that an awful lot of our brain is, is recruited when we're consuming energy dense foods, which I think is why it's such a, a challenge to get people to kind of eat a healthier diet. Um, so reward region, <clears throat> anticipated taste of high calorie foods and images of high calorie foods also activate the same reward regions. Um, and parenthetically, they also activate other regions such as visual, gustatory, uh, inhibitory, and motor control regions. And this is germane to some of the work I'll talk about later, uh, but we're basically able to capitalize on some of this uh, kind of neural architecture of the brain to kind of promote a reduction in um, uh, variable that predicts future weight gain. So um, it is important to distinguish between consumatory and anticipatory reward. It's going to sound, uh, uh, try not to talk too much about animal studies, but basically uh, with, with animals you can measure dopamine signaling in real time. And when uh, an animal like a, a mouse or a rat tastes an energy dense food, it fires dopamine. So, uh, fires dopamine off, it really signals clearly. But after conditioning, the dopamine signaling only occurs in response to cues that say you can get chocolate milkshake or whatever it is. So it's, it actually goes down and um, there's a lot of evidence that the more you overeat, the less you actually activate your reward circuitry when you eat food, which is kind of a alarming situation. Um, so there's uh, an ideologic, uh, ideologic theory that basically say that people who have greatest recruitment of reward circuitry when they consume high calorie foods would be more likely to overeat. Um, the incentive sensitization theory uh, is a little bit more nuanced and it says that cues associated with hedonic reward from palatable food intake uh, by a conditioning process come to activate reward regions and the activation of the reward regions, the high calorie food cues is what prompts overeating. Um, and Kent Barrett uh, has done some really, really great work but basically was trying to figure out, you know, if People who abuse substances like cocaine, for example, get less and less of an effect the more they use it. Why do they continue using it? And it really is a bit of a puzzle. The same exact thing happens with food, high calorie foods, um, and the answer is actually quite parallel to uh, the addictive processes with drugs. Um, so the, the dynamic vulnerability models just basically weave those two things together and basically says that people who get greater activation reward circuitry from eating energy dense foods will begin to overeat those foods, but that overeating actually is what changes our brains in very fundamental ways and they become hyper responsive to reward cues or food cues and hypo responsive to food tastes. So the more you overeat, the less food actually activates your reward circuitry. It, it's a very strange thing. Uh, Nora Volkoff, who is uh, headed up NIDA for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, had argued that, that people overeat to overcome this reward deficit. We, we now know about 15 years later that that's completely wrong and actually they eat less because they get less reward from food intake, but they eat more because they think about eating whenever they experience food cues. So um, I think it's a very important model, but you'll see a little bit more about this. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of correlational studies that basically found that obese versus lean human beings show greater reward response to high calorie food images and cues, but weaker reward region response to high calorie food taste. In fact, our very first uh, fMRI study that we did, we saw this pattern of findings and initially I thought, oh, I, I'm not sure if I believe this fMRI stuff. But the findings are going in the wrong direction, but it turns out it, it's a very robust uh, set of findings that maps on the neural imaging studies from uh, animals as well. Um, so we uh, decided to conduct some uh, prospective high risk studies and um, try to advance our knowledge of risk factors that contribute to weight gain. Um, we conducted two high-risk studies where we compared healthy adolescents with 
primal obesity to healthy adolescents without primal obesity. So we're looking at at-risk kids versus low-risk kids. And basically what we found was, I'm just going to kind of keep up a good pace here, is that healthy weight teens at risk for obesity show greater responsivity to high calorie food receipt and monetary reward. So, so initially they do show greater responsivity to kind of taste of chocolate milkshake and to even winning uh, uh, money in the scanner. Um, but they didn't show greater responsivity to cues for future uh, taste of chocolate milkshake or uh, images of the food. So it's really a, a kind of a strange risk process. We are able to replicate these findings in a second study that was a bit larger, and I won't get into the details, but the, the long and short is youth at risk for obesity start off having greater kind of reward from eating the same food. So if you go into a fifth grade classroom and give everybody a cupcake, some kids are really going to find it much more rewarding than others, and they're likely to kind of initiate a period of overeating that kind of derails some of this neural circuitry. Um, so in terms of prospective studies, uh, we actually started the first couple of um, large prospective studies to look at neural vulnerability factors to predict weight gain. Um, it's, it's really hard to get people food in the scanner, uh, which is why people hadn't done this previously, but fortunately we collaborated with somebody who figured out that challenge. Um, but our goal is to identify what neural vulnerability factors predict weight gain. Um, in our first study, we found uh, greater recruitment of uh, the orbital frontal cortex, which is a really important reward valuation region, to uh, cues that predicted high calorie um, images, presentation of those, predicted future weight gains. That was an encouraging start. Um, two other studies were able to follow up those findings and show greater recruitment of the striatum in response to high calorie foods, predicted weight gain. Um, this, this other small study with, from Giha had, had found very similar um, elevated reward region response to taste of high calorie foods, uh, predicting future weight gain. Uh, we tried to have a little bit more uh, ecological validity at this point in time, and we actually uh, put together uh, a, a, a volume of not, uh, but whatever, uh, Mythbusters is a television show, and we inserted unhealthy food commercials and, and control commercials. And we basically were able to find out that as kids sit in a scanner and watch this uh, television show, that when the, the high color food commercials came on, the kids who showed great, the greatest recruitment of the reward circuitry showed greater future waking. So we're, we're getting a pretty good um, pattern here that basically people who show greater recruitment of reward circuitry do great, uh, gain future weight gain, uh, suggesting that's an important intervention target. I'm going to... Um, not get into the greater details on this because I feel like this is probably more details than you all need, but um, in sum, uh, eight prospective studies have now found evidence that elevated reward region responsivity um, to food taste and images and uh, cues for these foods predicts future weight gain. Uh, the evidence that elevated reward region response to high calorie foods um, and images predict future weight gain is consistent with that ideologic model that kind of guides our work. Uh, the dynamic vulnerability model. Um, I'm going to keep this part brief because it's sort of uh, an interesting thing to know about, but it, it actually doesn't have any clear clinical implications uh, for treatment or prevention of, of obesity. Um, but animal experiments, you know, where you can basically do, you know, manipulate the food intake really very carefully and have full experimental control, find that as you begin to eat um, basically what human beings in America eat called a supermarket diet, as you begin to feed those, those types of diets to animals, they show dramatic downregulation of their dopaminergic reward circuitry, um, yet higher uh, excitability when they see cues for reward. So that separation of anticipatory and consumatory food reward. There's even a study that's one of my favorite ever um, that Aliso um, did a study where they um, ingested high calorie foods or equal um, amount of calories in the form of rat chow, which apparently is very healthy compared to the, the supermarket, supermarket diet used with animal studies. But it's, it basically they found evidence of downregulation from energy-dense foods and not from the same exact number of calories from rat chow, which is uh, really suggesting that all calories are not created equal, that really uh, highly palatable processed foods are much more effective at uh, recruiting reward circuitry than our fruits and vegetables and other natural foods. And it's really uh, quite alarming to kind of realize that we've uh, really created a 
a, a really bad place for human beings in the sense that, that we've fill the planet with all these really high energy dense foods that really do uh, change our reward circuitry. Um, but just very quickly, um, I just wanted to show this uh, slide that basically documents that effect that I talked about earlier, which we basically scan people twice over a six month period of time. And the people who gain weight, shown in the, um, the black line here, basically showed a marked reduction in recruitment of the striatum in response to tasting chocolate milkshake. So this is when I said the more you overeat, the less you actually get pleasure from eating. This, this is the, the finding that, that dictates that. Um, this has been um, replicated in a few other studies, but the other important finding is that adolescents who gain weight also, this is a, a separate sample, showed an increase in style response to cues for palatable foods. So basically, the more you overeat, the more your brain gets excited about overeating more. And it really, um, it, it looks an awful lot like what you see with drugs of abuse, that people have to escalate their intake and they kind of get sucked into it. Drugs and food uh, activate the same reward circuitry. We only have one, uh, one set of reward circuitry in our heads. Um, so it's, it's really overlapping, but this is, I'm um, just capturing some of the effects, and there's uh, additional findings out of this, but I think it's less relevant. But uh, the long and short of it is, if, if you let your kids eat really energy-dense foods, they're going to change their brains in two opposing ways, one of which really increases risk for future overeating. Um, so what we were interested in is this question, is can we make it easier for people to make healthier food choices? <clears throat> and we know... Um, you know, clearly, uh, exercise is important, and I don't mean to be a little exercise. Highly recommend it, but if people want to lose weight or not gain weight, it's far more important to alter uh, food intake, like the types of food they eat. Uh, if you just think a little bit about, you know, if you eat a Snickers bar, it takes you, what, you know, three or four minutes, um, and it would take you probably about an hour to burn off the Snickers bar if you wanted to go for a run. So it's much easier to swallow a lot of excess calories than it is to burn them off which is why we're focused a little bit more on the caloric intake side. Um, we uh, <clears throat> came across some very interesting research that came out of Europe um, that used a go-no-go -no -go and a stop signal training to reduce, um, to create inhibitory control and response to high-calorie food. So in the go-no-go -no -go paradigm, you're shown a food, and if there's a solid box around it, you're supposed to hit a button. If there's a dotted uh, line box around it, you're supposed to re refrain from hitting the button. So what that does is basically it has you make responses to a bunch of healthy foods, but has you inhibit repeatedly responses to unhealthy foods. Um, the stop signal training is very similar. <clears throat> you basically see a stimuli and on comes um, a signal that says either respond, the blue box, or don't respond, the gray box. And so all these tasks are doing is basically having people develop an approach response, but then they're basically cued to inhibit that approach response hundreds of times when they see unhealthy foods. So what that does is it produces weight loss. And it wasn't a big weight loss in these two early studies, but um, I was very intrigued by this, the idea that you could play a video game essentially and lose weight it seemed like, wow, that would be a really great solution. Uh, if you ever talk to somebody who's on a weight loss diet and they're trying really hard to not eat the foods they love, it's miserable. They're not happy. And <clears throat> the more you succeed in dieting in the sense of not eating, the higher the reward value of the food goes up, and it's particularly the case for really energy-dense food. So this is why dietary restriction is not a good solution for the obesity epidemic, is pretty much nobody can pull it off on a long-term basis to achieve a healthier weight. Um, but this uh, paradigm is very promising, so we're very enticed by that. There is also uh, another paradigm called the attention modification therapy, um, and also respond signal training. In the attention modification therapy, you complete a task that's shown here, and you're basically shown two foods. Um, in the critical um, pictures, there's a high-calorie food and a low-calorie food, and you're supposed to indicate which side the probe, the black dot, appears behind, and you'll notice that it appears behind the grapes, and then it appears behind the apple. And so what this is doing is it's reinforcing people to pay attention to healthy foods, but not to the high-calorie foods. Um, so this is just basically shutting the attentional blinds so you won't notice food cues that prompt overeating. Um, so we thought that an intervention in which people are trained to inhibit a strong behavioral approach response to high-calorie food may reduce elevated reward-reaching responsivity to food that drives overeating, 
this is a neural vulnerability factor that I talked about discovering, but we also reason the training attention away from high calorie foods and towards um, low calorie foods may reduce cue induced overeating. So if you're watching television and you see a commercial for McDonald's come up, does it prompt you to go out and go to McDonald's? That it should make it a lot easier for that not to happen if you direct attention away from the energy dense foods. Um, so there is an academic question, which is, how does this intervention work? Does it just change valuation of high calorie foods? There's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is the case, that if, after you do the training, you rate the palatable foods as less palatable and you're willing to pay less money for them. Uh, there's also evidence that it reduces attentional bias for high calorie foods. Um, so basically, after doing the attention training um, intervention, you pay less attention to foods, you just notice them a lot less. Um, but there's also the idea that you just basically improve your inhibitory control. Um, I don't believe this for a second because our control conditions are the exact same training paradigms with non-food images. So you're getting better at inhibitory control on our control conditions. So that one is probably not supported. Um, but what we did is we wove together these four or five training paradigms um, in which basically people respond hundreds of times to healthy foods but are cued to not respond hundreds of times to high calorie foods and to complete um, two different uh, attention training paradigms which train attention towards healthy foods that are away from unhealthy foods. So um, that's the long and short of it. Um, in the first trial that we published in 2017, we randomized 47 obese adults to this food response and attention training versus generic training, same exact paradigm, but with pictures of butterflies and flowers and stuff like that. Um, the training only took four hours, um, and we did personalize the food images. So we had asked people to say, what types of foods do you like to overeat the most, or do you struggle with overeating with the most? And, and then have them picture the, the, select the pictures that they find most appetizing, because you really want this to kind of fire up the reward circuitry when you do these trainings. Um, I think that personalized um, image presentation is very important. What we found is palatability ratings for high calorie foods decreased uh, for the response training versus control participants. Monetary evaluations of the high calorie foods, which basically says how much are you willing to pay for uh, a candy bar or whatever it is, and it gets, it's just a way of valuing, um, attaching value to the stimuli, but uh, the value of the money they're willing to pay for energy-dense food goes down. These behavioral data suggest changes in valuation of energy-dense foods. In addition, uh, we use brain imaging to kind of see if we could actually alter the neural, the neural vulnerability factors that we had discussed earlier. And what we saw as intervention versus control participants showed significantly greater re reductions in responsivity, reward, and attention regions to high-calorie foods versus low-calorie food images. You, you can't fake blood flow, so <clears throat> I have a lot of confidence in these findings. But we saw reductions in attention, reward, and sensory processing regions. Um, here's an image showing the uh, inferior, inferior parietal lobe, the putamen, and the mid infla, which are regions in taste processing and reward. Um, but we saw nice reductions, and it's, it's really nice when you can actually capture the effect of your intervention with changes in brain function. I think that's a pretty good bar of testing interventions. Um, the reductions in postcentral gyrus and mid inflow are correlated with reductions in palatability ratings of the high calorie foods, and the reductions in butamin and mid inflow uh, correlated with reductions in monetary evaluation of the high calorie foods. When you do a study like this, you really want to see the brain imaging data correspond to kind of behavioral or self report data to really make sure you're interpreting things correctly. So that's why I'm chatting about that. Um, most critically, the intervention versus control participants showed significantly re greater reductions in body fat from pre to post. Uh, the body fat loss effect at six month follow up did not reach significance. It, it sort of uh, gone down by about half, suggesting the need for ongoing training. Um, but the fact that we saw, you know, directly, you know, uh, a significant reduction in body fat from just basically playing a video game is, is pretty encouraging because it was only a four hour intervention. Uh, the reductions in body fat correlate with changes in palatability ratings of the high calorie foods and the low calorie foods, again, triangulating the findings. Um, and I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, so we just finished an experimental therapeutics trial that tested whether adding this food response uh, and attention training to a dissonance-based obesity prevention program increased body fat loss. 
this this obesity prevention program that we you know, it's just a regular six uh, one hour session uh, group based intervention has produced a 42 percent reduction in overweight or obesity onset over a two year follow up versus an educational video control. I should say education is not a very good solution to obesity. We use educational videos as our control conditions for all of our studies, really illustrating that it's not a lack of knowledge that, that is driving obesity, but something far more complex. Uh, but anyway, uh, we also saw a 40% reduction in overweight, overweight and obesity onset compared to an alternative obesity prevention program. So the, the, the prevention program had a solid evidence base, and we tested whether adding the food response and attention training increased body fat loss, um, basically what, what we found was completing the response and attention training in addition to the healthy uh, Project Health, which is the name of the intervention, produced significantly greater body fat loss and completed Project Health versus a control. Uh, this was highly significant, like a p-value of 0.01. Um, and this, in this trial, training lasted only two hours. We had improved the training in a couple ways that I won't bore you with, but we made it work better. Um, and, you know, the take home from, uh, take away from this is for each hour of training, there was a 2.4% greater reduction in body fat. Now, that's pretty significant. So if you can do that, I mean, people go through Weight Watchers for a whole year, and at the end of that, the average percent body fat reduction uh, is oftentimes between 5 and 10%, and then weight regain occurs. So this was a fairly encouraging amount of body fat reduction from a very, very brief intervention, so it's kind of... Um, Exciting in that sense. Um, so in conclusion, uh, elevated reward region response to food images and cues predicts future weight gain. Regular intake of these high calorie foods increases reward region response to the cues, which further increases overeating. So in other words, overeating makes your vulnerability factor get worse, which is, I think, a really important message uh, as a parent. You know, I try to communicate this to my kids to try to encourage them not to uh, get into the habit of consuming really energy-dense foods. Um, and the food response and ambition training reduces valuation of high-calorie foods and produces body fat loss. Um, future directions, um, we're very excited about um, trying to increase the, the magnitude of the effects of this intervention. Um, I won't get into the details of that, but I think there's a couple promising directions that we could go. And I wanted to just thank my colleagues that helped me do with all this research and uh, take questions. So thanks. Wonderful, thank you. Um, that's a really wonderful uh, presentation and rapid uh, overview of a complex um, aspect stuff. But but I, I think that uh, for um, the scientists uh, on the commission and for the general public, I think it, it's pretty apparent. Um, that that uh, your work is is showing some really important things that we can all learn from. Um, I have a, a bunch of questions uh, that, that uh, as chair, I, I'll, I'll I'll go first, and then we'll open up to the other other commissioners. But um, there are some diseases, unfortunately, that um, have uh, lost our ability to to satiate. So, for example, Prader Willi is a genetic disease. Uh, where individuals will um, basically eat themselves to death, um, and there's been many attempts to try to work with those those individuals, and it's very difficult. Um, have you studied, or is there research work uh, with similar kind of analysis with people with Prader Willi or any of the other syndromes where people don't have the ability to satiate? We have not tried that yet, uh, although there is uh, a lot of interest in that in Cambridge. I know there's some neuroscientists there that have been very interested in uh, different monogenetic mono disorders um, like that. And it, what's, what's interesting is, is one of the commonalities between the disorders that seem to increase risk for excessive weight gain, you know, the, the lack of fatality is, is a really critical element. Um, but there's also, you often see um, deficits in executive control. People just don't have good motor control, attentional control, planning abilities, uh, cognitive flexibility. Um, so one of the, the big efforts right now is to see, can we train executive control to kind of produce some of these benefits? Um, but yeah, that, uh, I'm acutely aware of that particular uh, you know, disorder, and it definitely is uh, not at all easy to, to treat or address. And I, I think uh, certainly the, the standard treatments that we use for most people who are cognitively healthy are, are not going to succeed in these populations. 
it would be interesting actually to see um, if, if the parts of the brain light up similarly to the control population with with people who are afflicted with Prader Willi. Um, what, what about um, with more common um, um, diseases or syndromes, people who have um, either um, bulimia or uh, anorexia and have been um, afflicted and have had problems? Um, have you tested those, or are there studies that have been done on those people with similar kind of intervention? Yeah, no, I, one of the, the big teams that I work with uh, is over in the, the United Kingdom in uh, London, and they've actually tried to use this to treat people with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. So far, the effects don't seem to be working very well, but there's there's a lot of nuances that go into this training, and it's 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 hard to know whether the training is doesn't work for that population or um, whether the you know the, the training wasn't done well or whether the population is not responsive. But we. Um, definitely use, uh, you know, the, the treatments that we use for people with eating disorders take an entirely different approach, and it, it, it works pretty well that you get about 55% of the people will get over their eating disorders in about an eight-week period of time. Um, but, yeah, we haven't added the response and attention training, and a lot of that is people are very concerned about anorexia nervosa and under-eating. In fact, um, I was actually thinking that reversing this contingency, you could use it with anorexia nervosa patients, and you might get them to like and value food more. Um, we're really interested in studying that phenomena, but we uh, know very little about anorexia nervosa. But it, it hasn't turned out to be a boon for people with eating disorders versus obesity. Um, but it, it does. There's, there's been really good effects for alcohol use problems that people drink too much. You can have them do very similar trainings, and you get reductions in alcohol intake. So it does seem like it's a broader, it, it has a utility for other clinical applications. Does the same parts of the brain that you showed us uh, light up uh, with either the bulimic population or on people afflicted with anorexia? Yes, for bulimia nervosa and, and binge eating disorder, which is like bulimia, but without the compensatory weight control behaviors. Anorexia nervosa is a completely different bird. We really, uh, we actually, our group is the only uh, group on the planet that's found risk factors to predict onset of anorexia nervosa. And these kids are like really, really skinny when they're born, throughout childhood, in adolescence, and something triggers them into anorexia nervosa that we're just starting to wrap our head around, but it seems to be people who are endogenously just not very interested in food, maybe they're a little bit more neurotic, they just don't eat too much and they're always lean. And if you have a spike in negative affect, boom, that seems to be when anorexia nervosa kind of falls out of the, you know, emerges. So, yeah, so my main focus is actually on eating disorders. And, and I would say we've, uh, we've done much better with that. We can prevent, um, we have an intervention that we can do with people that will cut uh, about 75% of the eating disorders that would emerge in the control group uh, from happening. So there's really good prevention programs for eating disorders now, and we're just working to implement them broadly, but they have nothing to do with response and attention training. Fantastic. So um, just thinking about it from, from a social uh, Darwinian point of view, I mean, the way um, the brain works or the way people get satiated, uh, why would that develop? I mean, why would that be something that, that 10,000 years ago in the hunter-gatherer society, that, that this is being reinforced so that we would have a selective advantage to keep on doing what we're doing, even though it's unhealthy for us? Yeah, I mean, it, and it wasn't unhealthy for us. I mean, if you go back to, you know, 1900, uh, the, the rate of obesity in America was about 5%. So it, it's not, um, you know, for, for most of our prehistory, we did not have really high rates of obesity and the medical morbidity and mortality. Um, but from an evolutionary standpoint, what this neural circuitry really does is help you figure out where to get calories and remember where to look for calories in the future, which is really essential, uh, particularly back when we didn't have any way of preserving food. You know, if you kill something, you, can't, you just had to eat it. You know, and then we figured out how to smoke it and ice caves and this stuff, and we figured out other ways of preserving food. But back in the old days, uh, there was an awful lot of people who died really early, and malnutrition was a significant factor. So I, I think this neural circuitry evolved and served us very well for 10,000 years. It's just uh, when we started making highly processed foods that are a little bit 
we pack more fat and sugar in the foods now than existed previously, and it just seems to be too much for our brains. Like we def- we've created something that's not very good for us. But in the same way, if, if you think about cocaine, then sorry to use the, the keep using the cocaine example, but you know if you would chew coca leaves, which people do in a lot of countries, it's kind of like coffee. It just gives you a mild buzz. It's not addictive. It's not problematic. But it was when a scientist isolated the active ingredient and made it so people could get really high on it that we've created problems. So we've created lots of problems for ourselves, and obesity is one of them. And, and lastly, before I open it up to, to all the other commissioners, uh, we know, unfortunately, with, with uh, COVID-19, that people who had uh, uh, obesity, high BMIs, were significantly at increased risk to be hospitalized, to end up in an ICU, be intubated and or um, unfortunately die. Um, with the CARES Act, with other kind of government response to um, this and the known obesity uh, epidemic, um, has it been easier for you to and, and co- your colleagues and, and people doing similar research uh, to tap into any of those funds, or do you see in the near future an increased capability of getting funding um, from um, COVID or um, NIH because of the COVID disease? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm the last person to complain about funding from NIH have been extremely generous uh, in the past. I, I don't think I've noticed a, a market uptick in funding, but there have, there have been a lot of uh, calls for research proposals that are COVID-related, so I think, um, yes, we are seeing kind of more money being directed towards that. And, I, you know, I feel like it's one of the, the best things about America is the fact that we invest a lot of money in, in research and it benefits everybody in, around the globe. It's not like it just benefits uh, taxpayers here in the U.S. So I, I just think that's really fantastic. When I was part of a conference that was around the whole world this morning and most of the other people are not in places where they can get very much funding to do good research. And um, the U.S. has been good in that regard. Fantastic. So, Thank you. That really wonderful. Um, and to tell you, it's you know, uh, this the commission has been having these kinds of uh, um, discussions for for um, you know since its creation. And what I would say to you is, you you actually um, have really got the entire commission really interested um, because I think all but one of the commissioners have raised their hand electronically. Um, and so uh, you've obviously uh, uh, have sparked the centers of their brain to stimulate them to, to ask questions. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Kalfani, you're up. Great. Thank you. Um, while you were talking, thank you, again, thank you again for the presentation and the information. But as you were talking, um, questions that started to come up for me was thinking about folks who are in communities that are considered um, food deserts or um, when you think of communities where there's not lots of access to um, healthy foods, right, or families that are barely making it in in their choices and how they choose foods for their family could be, you know, they don't have what's needed to, to go to the grocery store for more healthy foods and, you know, jack in a box may be that uh, priority because you can feed a family, uh, a large size family with small amounts of money, but that's not your best choice of food. So just curious about how those types of realities play into this type of research. Um, so that was like, you know, what was going on through my mind as I was listening to you. Yeah, and, and uh, be, thank you for your question. <clears throat> Obesity is certainly uh, a multi-determined, uh, you know, situation that the food desert is just crazy. I just remember still kind of walking around San Francisco trying to look for some fruit in the Tenderloin District, and it was just like all you could get was like just convenience stores that just had the high energy dense foods. Um, so. There's absolutely uh, cost restrictions. You know, getting good organic, healthy foods is a lot more expensive. A lot of people can't afford of it. Um, there's a, a lot of food insecurity, and it prompts people to eat in ways that are maybe self-destructive. Um, so I, we definitely need uh, a lot of interventions uh, out there to kind of change the availability of healthy foods, 
Um, it, you know, if I were uh, able to kind of affect some policy changes, you know, I mean, what we're doing in America right now is we are making things like high fructose corn syrup and beef and cheese way more affordable, and we're not doing anything to make healthy foods more affordable. Um, so we have the, you know, all these uh, kind of reinforcement mechanisms to pump out more healthy food, and we're not really kind of supporting the healthy food. So I agree fully that we need to be uh, talking about food insecurity, talking about food deserts. Um, it's uh, definitely a, a, a challenge that, um, that, that we haven't had. You know, when you think about obesity, it's not equally distributed, and there's disparities in this. And so I'm, I'm very, very mindful that um, a lot of people have been doing work in that area and trying to kind of make alterations. Uh, I think Adam Gronowski up at the University of Washington has done some of the, the most interesting work in this regard. Um, but unfortunately, like all the experiments that people go in and try to do work with food deserts and food insecurity, um, it's proven a pretty hard challenge to solve. So I think, you know, we live in a, a, a capitalist culture that says you can sell cigarettes and alcohol and high fat junk food to people and make all the money you want. And we might want to reevaluate that, whether, you know, we want to curtail, uh, you know, the way we've curtailed advertisement of cigarettes and alcohol to kids, we might want to think about the same thing with energy dense foods, but um, it's, it's a tricky business, but thanks, thanks for your question. Do you have an, another question, Tucker? No? Um, just to follow up on, on, on that, um, is there an age where things start to change? I mean, obviously, kids are uh, going to react a little bit differently than, say, you know, a 65 year old guy like myself. Yeah, well, what we know right now is, uh, <clears throat> you know, obesity certainly emerges in childhood and it's uh, tripled in uh, prevalence uh, in children over the last three decades. So it's definitely going up. But most people, when they hit adolescence, they actually decrease their body weight because they're still growing so much. So obesity really emerges in, in spades in, in the young adulthood around uh, late adolescence, early uh, 20s and 30s. Um, and then it really tails off as we start to lose our ability to, to taste food. As you know, as we age, we lose more and more of our sensory neurons, and fortunately, it, it, it reduces how much obesity emerges in later adulthood. So it's, it's really the middle of life that we got to work us work the most on. Um, but you know, certainly the some of the things that I talked about today in terms of the neural vulnerability factors really clearly communicate that. If you can keep people in a healthy body weight and not eating these energy dense foods on a really regular basis, they won't produce these neural changes that really lock them into a life of obesity. And there's other changes that occur in terms of your metabolic rate. So if you're, you know, 50 pounds overweight and you lose 50 pounds, it gets harder and harder and harder to lose that weight the more you lose uh, the, the pounds because your body is depending against weight loss because it thinks you're about to die of starvation. So there's all these maintenance factors that emerge with obesity that, for sure, it's way better to help people not develop it in the first place than to try to get them back out of it after they've experienced it, um, which sounds really pessimistic, and I don't mean to sound like that, but it's, it's, it's an abysmal, uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing to treat. Wonderful. Commissioner Shannon. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. Um, so I have, I work with um, communities that are unhoused or low-income communities, and I'm wondering, I'm really fascinated by the addiction part of this, um, and I'm wondering, is there a correlation between um, stress as a trigger um, for maybe a proclivity for this kind of um, addiction, and then also, is it connected somehow to survival instincts because it seems to me that people have a certain proclivity to one um, addiction over maybe something else, but then it seems like it becomes part of their survival instinct that they sort of have to have it. And I think you sort of mentioned that a little bit at the tail end of your answer to the last question. Um, and then I have a few other questions, but if you could answer that. Yeah, let, let me start with those two because I, I don't want to get too far off because my working memory is strained up. I swear to God, in COVID, like the ability to remember a whole bunch of stuff is just gets harder and harder. But so in response to the question about stress, uh, both stress and negative affect, so feeling depressed or anxious or uh, any negative emotional experience, 
increases the reward value of food. So it's the most weird thing, but basically under stress and, and these other negative emotional experiences, food tastes better. It activates your reward circuitry better. Um, and I, we, we don't really have a firm understanding of why that's the case, but there's a whole bunch of factors that make overeating more likely. Anything that increases the reward value of food, such as stress and negative aspect, and dieting. Dieting totally makes donuts taste better. It's like the, the horror, it's the, worst, it's the worst thing. But um, so those things all do increase the reward value of food. So I think stress is very important. Um, there's some other things that occur with stress in particular uh, with the endocrine system that, that definitely has other negative ramifications as well. Um, you know, the, the addiction to the proclivity thing is a very interesting thing is because I think what we're learning is you know, the word addiction, and I use that very loosely because I, I actually don't think drugs are addictive and I don't think food's addictive. I think people can develop an addictive relationship with food or drugs. So, you know, to, to put it this way, the data that, I, as I understand it, um, somewhere in the ballpark of about 60 to 70 percent of Americans will try smoking cigarettes a month in their life, but only about 24 percent actually get into a habit and smoke regularly. So most people who try smoking don't get addicted. And smoking is definitely the most addictive thing that we've created as humans um, in terms of how rapidly people get addicted and how many people it kills, because that's the first leading cause of death. Um, but there's something really, really bizarre that I think once you turn to something for your dopamine, whether that's you know donuts or smoking or, or something else, the more likely you are to go back to that same dopamine well, and you're not likely to develop other ones. So it's, it's really a kind of curious thing. It's almost like if you develop obesity, you're actually at slightly lower risk for alcoholism and some other problems. And it's like there's a specialization, but it's, it's about reward learning. Our, our brains are really good at learning cues for things that give us pleasure. And unfortunately, it sort of specializes, or maybe it's fortunate because that way you get a little bit more of a specialization. But you, you said you had other questions? Yeah, so is there um, something in the works to make these sort of inhibition training programs readily accessible? Are they already accessible? Maybe they are and we just don't know it. Um, but it would be great to get this into specific communities. I had the same question about food deserts, but um, the other commissioner asked that question already. But it would be great to get this you know, into communities um, where we might need it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. almost any community, really, at this point. Yeah, so um, Natalia Lawrence, who's based in the UK, has created some um, go-no-go -no -go tasks that are, it's one-fifth of the, the intervention that I just described. That is freely available, but the bad news is she's done it, I think it's primarily on phones, and I don't think it works on the phone. It's like a phone screen is too small. You don't get as excited about the food because it's kind of hard to see and it doesn't fire up reward circuitry as much. Um, <clears throat> but, but yeah, so some people have made it available. Um, you know, I'm chatting with some folks about trying to kind of figure out a way to commercialize this and get it out to people. Um, all the other interventions that we've developed with NIH funding, we just give away. So my guess is we'll eventually get to a place where we probably try that and just leave it at that. But um, you know, right now, I think we're still in the phase of how do we make this work better for most people? Um, so that's, you know, we're, we're at the bigger effect size right now, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to kind of roll it out. But there's, um, you know, Luminosity and a whole bunch of other companies that do brain training. It would be very natural for have, to, to have them include uh, kind of food response and inhibition training. So hopefully yeah. that will occur. And then um, I had one more question, which is, has this been tested on people with um, insulin resistance um, or other, you know, problems where maybe the food that they're eating would cause greater obesity than someone else, right? Because it's triggering the pancreas. And right. Yeah. Um, no, not yet that I'm aware of. Although, you know, I was just part of a, a conference this morning that took place. I mean, it was in Amsterdam, but there was people from all around the globe. It was like the most bizarre thing because it's different times everywhere. And I met somebody uh, at King's College who is trying to use this with individuals with type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is much much more comorbid with obesity. Um, so I think people are moving in that direction and we'll, we'll see some, uh, 
you know, op opportunities for those individuals because it really, you know, certainly type 1 diabetes is like you, know, you basically have to be on this major diet for the rest of your life and it just causes, uh, we see about 60% of people, of women with type 1 diabetes develop eating disorders. So it's an ultra high risk group for eating disorders. So we really need uh, good interventions for that population. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Commissioner Hissarik. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seitz, for your presentation. Um, I see ads on television for something called Noom, which sounds like it purports to be some sort of a psychological approach to diet control. Is that what? Where does that fit in the spectrum of things? That's a very good question. I've heard about it. I have not followed it. I'm one of those weird people that doesn't have a TV, so I don't learn anything about popular culture. So I, I've heard about this, but I think that that is more of a, an app that helps you, you know, eat less and exercise more. But I'm not, I don't think it's a response training um, or attentional training intervention. But that's, I, I wish I knew the answer, but I, I, I'm speaking outside of my, my knowledge. Okay, well, I don't know anything about it either other than the ads I see. I, I mean, I would imagine that, that there are other diet programs that attempt to incorporate some of the psychological uh, cues that you discussed here. I, I don't know what they are, but they must be. Yeah, there's, there's been one, one other effort, which is a really strange thing, and it's going to sound a little bit like torture, but they, uh, Anita Janssen in the Netherlands and Terry Buttel, who's at UC San Diego, have done um, cue exposure. So you basically sit people down who are overweight and present them with all these energy dense foods that they love, so chocolate, cake, uh, you know, ice cream, all this stuff, and they don't eat it. They're just exposed to it without eating it, and that's supposed to make you not be as responsive to those foods. Um, I think it works, but on the other hand, the people who go through it say it's just torture because they want to eat the food, and they're sitting there exposed to it. Um, and so that hasn't really rolled out and been uh, kind of broadly implemented just because the acceptability is lower. That, that's why I think doing kind of this response and attention training you know, it's not a painful or ardu arduous process, and it should theoretically make it easier for you to make healthier food choices. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's uh, hopefully we'll see more things roll out, but it's, um, I, I have noticed that it's really interesting that the, the diet industry is this enormous industry in America, yet recruiting people for obesity prevention programs is really, really hard. Oh, Even if 70% of us are gonna be obese or overweight, hardly anybody wants to sign up for a uh, prevention program to kind of help you learn kind of how to develop a healthy relationship with food and exercise. Hmm. Thank you. So it's a tricky business. <laughs> but maybe profitable for some. I don't know. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I think there's a lot of people who make a lot of money. It wouldn't be as academic, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the noon thing is really interesting. It's more like a combination of a video game slash 12-step uh, program. So what happens is you have a sponsor, and so it's 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 phone based primarily, so that individuals are uh, through the algorithms within it um, are putting in what they're eating, so they're aware of it. But then there's a person who is basically going over everything you're eating and seeing how well you're doing it. So there's a positive reinforcement, and there's also when you slip. There's an individual that, to, to give you a pep talk and also give you suggestions. And the algorithms work so that it makes it very efficient for them um, so that they can basically utilize their real life people or, you know, um, uh, individuals who, who are typing to you as if they're a real, real life person um, so that they really know who you are. Um, and um, it's very cost efficient for them to do it, which is how it works so well, I think. But, but um, I'm glad, glad somebody knew the answer to that question. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Limos. I first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, based on Dr. Kofani's and Shannon's uh, comments, uh, the first thing I thought about when I, you know, heard your presentation was thinking about socioeconomic status and. You know, in your presentation, I didn't see any information about the participants, and so I'm wondering if socioeconomic status is an impact to your study. Uh, did you find it to be a limitation? So I'd like to know more about that. 
Yeah, so in our work, uh, we strive to recruit uh, ethnically diverse samples um, that have SES differences and uh, obesity and overweight affect lower SES uh, people a little bit more than higher SES people. So they would have been overrepresented in our samples. Um, but with a lot of our work, I, I test to see whether the intervention effects are moderated, or in other words, do the interventions work equally well for various ethnic groups and for different uh, levels of, of income? We haven't, uh, we, we don't have enough data to do that quite yet. So it's a it's a very good question, but I would, you know, one of the general themes of interventions are uh, that they work better for the higher risk population. So in other words, if you're trying to prevent depression and you work with everybody versus working with people who have elevated depressive symptoms, the effects are way better for the high-risk people. So it would follow that this intervention may work more well for low socioeconomic status individuals, um, but we have not addressed that question. In fact, it's actually making me think that would be a, a pretty good idea for a grant proposal. So thank you for that thought. Any other commissioners have questions? It looked look like uh, there were more people, but it looks like you answered questions that people then dropped off their hands, which means that uh, I think a lot of people were thinking the same same things when they asked your questions. Well, it looks like Susie Shannon is raising her hand. Yeah, she, she, she asked already, and I think she's just not. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, give her, I'll give her another shot to ask another question. I was actually kind of wondering how you raised well, your hand. <laughs> I, I do have another question, actually. Um, so what, for the Go No Go trainings, is there like a recidivism rate that, in other words, do you watch people over time? Um, just like you were saying about Weight Watchers and people tend to gain that weight back over the course of two years. I may have missed that in your presentation, but I'm just wondering what that rate is. We, we uh, currently have five projects going on that are valued this are evaluating this intervention. Um, all of the ones that we've published already just had, um, did not go beyond six month follow up. So we do not know how well this persists over time. And I, you know, knowing that all obesity treatments tend to not work over the long haul makes me very dubious about it. Um, I, I strongly suspect that we would have to uh, have people continue to do trainings as, as they go through life and meet new and interesting foods that are unhealthy for them, but they tend to have to try not to eat too much of. Um, so yeah, I have no idea. I, but I would say that I feel like, you know, response and attention training, you know, adding that on to an intervention that just basically helps people learn how to make adjustments to their dietary intake and, and exercise levels to achieve energy balance. I mean, that's the holy grail. If you just eat the number of calories that you need, you're good. So, um, I, I don't think response and attention training in isolation is going to be enough to really deliver the kind of uh, successful uh, treatment that we need, but I think it will be a good addendum to other interventions. Uh, for instance, I chatted with uh, the lead researcher at Weight Watchers about the idea of trying to incorporate this, and I think there's some interest in that type of um, making it more freely available or readily available for people, but um, I cannot say anything about the long-term effects. Um, but in a couple more years, I should uh, have a whole bunch of studies. We're also applying this to uh, try to reduce intake of high uh, carcinogenic food. So trying to get people to reduce the intake of foods that contribute to cancer specifically, which is a little bit different than the foods that just contribute to overweight. Right. And then um, do you find in the case of stress triggers, um, is there any research on... Um, like a replacement trigger? Because I know that you said that people tend to go to that sort of same thing for the dopamine increase in, the mm -hmm. do in dopamine. But is there, I'm wondering, because like a lot of times you hear about people who like stop um, smoking and then they <laughs> start eating more food. Um, so is there... That totally happens. That for sure. In fact, on that very note, there's a very interesting piece of information. You talk to people who smoke and they're like, oh, I smoke to control my weight. There is no evidence that starting smoking causes a pound of weight loss, but there is a whole bunch of evidence that quitting smoking causes a lot of weight gain. In fact, 
in several prospective studies, the number one predictor of future weight gain was quitting smoking. It beat wow. out everything else, but it's, yeah. So, um, but going back to your question about the replacement, um, I mean, I, I think the, the best thing to do is get people really into exercise. Because if you get people into exercise, they get positive aspect from exercise, they begin to think, oh, I should put good, good gas in the car if I'm going to go do a 10-mile hike or something like that. You just think differently about food when you're trying to basically make it so that exercise is not totally painful or you bonk and run out of uh, blood sugar. Um, but I don't have any any special insights, but the, the one thing that I thought that was really interesting is that, you know, bariatric surgery is kind of heralded as the best treatment for obesity, so we basically alter our stomachs so we can't swallow a lot of food is what it comes down to. It, it affects your vagal nerve and, and satiety signaling as well, and that's probably why it works, but there was a whole bunch of cases of new alcoholism among people who went through bariatric surgery who had never had alcoholism before. And it, it turns out what happens is with ruin Y, which is when you sort of bypass the stomach as opposed to banding and sleeving, which is, you know, you put a little plastic band around your esophagus and make it harder to swallow. Um, you, you see alcoholism because the, the, you basically get way more uh, drunk because you have a little small stomach and your absorption is just super rapid. So what we are finding is that ruin Y bariatric surgery definitely increases your chance of, of onset of alcoholism, which is as close as I can get a, a symptom substitution, but it's, it's not a good one. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah, okay. it, it would be a good thought to come up with a, a healthy one that we could get people more excited about, but it's, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, what you really want to do is get people excited about eating healthy and exercising, and it, it's just all that circuitry that I just talked about occurs for people who eat healthy food. And they get, you know, they, they have the same motives and drives. It's just for healthy food instead of unhealthy food. So, you know, I really think it's a, a major paradigm shift to get people to really abandon a, a certain quality of diet. But I really think it's those highly processed foods that are just higher in energy density than other foods to be mad. Nah, I think just getting those out of your diet is probably the best approach rather than trying to look for some symptom substitution. But... Yeah, I wish I had a, a more interesting response. And then I have one more question. Um, I know that there, I don't know if this was a study or not, but just like the colors on junk food, right, with the bright oranges and reds um, and that kind of thing, um, is that also a trigger for people to sort of gravitate toward that? And what, like, is the psychology behind that? Well, I mean, if you uh, <clears throat> imagine you've never eaten a McDonald's, seen the golden arches, seen a plastic tray, a brown plastic tray. I'm not sure if that's what they still use. But all those things become cues. In fact, the orange, um, the yellow, those are cues that make you think of that food when you see those after you've had the conditioning process. And I would even go so far as to say time of day and mood become food cues as well. So if you always eat when you're lonely, you start to feel lonely, you're like, oh, I better go eat or depressed, and you, I mean, it's the same thing. So cues can be just ubiquitous. So it's really um, the, the power of all these things that, that all add up, you know, when you, when you think of uh, just all the stimuli that have power over our eating decisions, it's, it's kind of alarming uh, when we sort of think of that conditioning process. But um, it's, uh, I don't think most Americans think about it this way at all, that the Kent Berger's theory about that whole conditioning process that really keeps us, I think, stuck in addiction and overeating is profoundly underappreciated. Um, but, you know, he studies, like, facial express expressions of mice and rats, so I think people don't really read a whole lot of it, but it would be really good to kind of get parents to kind of think a lot more about the, the foods they give their kids and the processes that they're setting their kids up to experience that might keep them stuck in an overeating kind of pattern. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Wonderful. So if anybody, um, if they want to know, uh, if you click on participant in the far right-hand corner, there's three little dots. If you hit that, that's the way you raise a hand or lower your hand. Uh, any other commissioners with a question? 
if if not, I don't see one. Then, uh, Dr. Stites, we're we're thrilled uh, that you came to uh, down to Los Angeles to uh, uh, speak to us today. Uh, we're truly honored uh, that you would share your um, uh, education, research, uh, and your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you on behalf of the uh, uh, LA City Health Commission and all the people of the City of Los Angeles. Thank you for uh, educating us and uh, giving us things to think about how we could help our population hopefully uh, improve its, its health and uh, um, maybe uh, lose some weight along the way. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to chat with you, and I really enjoyed the questions and thoughtful interactions. So thank thanks for, and, and thank you for teaching me how to raise, raise my hand. I'm excited. I learned something today. Positive reinforcement. There you go. There. All right. Take care. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye. Moving on to uh, agenda item number two, uh, uh, call for nominations for our officers. Um, uh, our second vice president, uh, Commissioner uh, Ossie, uh, uh, and, uh, is interested in being uh, uh, staying on as a second vice president and treasurer. Uh, unfortunately, the last minute she uh, had mentioned that she cannot be here um, this evening, though she was originally planning to be here. Um, but I'm going to put her name in nomination. So I'll make the nomination. I'm asking for a second uh, for her to be a second vice president. I'll, I'll second that. Uh, so uh, I'm the nominee. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm the, uh, the person putting the name in nomination. Uh, and uh, Commissioner uh, Hissrick is, uh, uh, is the second. Is there anybody else want to put a name in for second vice president slash treasurer? Okay, so um, I'm seeing none. We'll put her name in uh, for second vice president. Um, we'll have a, a vote at the next uh, in the August meeting um, if people uh, decide that they want to run against her. Um, I think that uh, our bylaws would allow that, uh, but this gives some time for people to think about it. Um, she's done a great job as second vice president, and uh, uh, I'm enthusiastic having her stay on. Um, for first vice president, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, uh, Matt Grimmig to stay in that position of first vice president. Um, is there a second? I'll second it as John Hissrick. Commissioner Hissrick is the second. Is there anybody else who is wanting to be first vice president? Seeing none, uh, I am thrilled uh, that uh, Matt will stay on and uh, we'll have a vote again in, in, uh, in August. Sounds good. Thank you. And um, I'd like to take the time to, uh, you know, obviously over the last year, I think we've had probably since the three years plus that I've been on, on this commission, uh, some of the best presentations we've had, um, even though it's, you know, kind of been a little weird with COVID, uh, we've had a lot of good uh, presentations, a lot of good folks coming in to talk to the, the group. So, uh, Dr. Mandel, I think you've done a great job. And, uh, I'd like to, if you want to, uh, put you up for remaining <clears throat> as our, our president of the commission. Is there? I, I accept your nomination. Is there a second? Yes, a second. Michael Sroda, sir. Um, thank you, Commissioner Sroda. Is there anybody else who wants to be uh, the president uh, of the commission? Or anybody else that wants to nominate somebody else? Seeing none, uh, same thing. The vote will be next uh, in next meeting in August. Um, so we'll have that as one of the agenda items for the next. Moving on to the third agenda uh, item, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to invite uh, our counselor and uh, city attorney, um, 
Attorney Vaughn, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and the Commission. I'm going to take a very short period of time on this presentation um, because there isn't actually a lot. Um, there is mo there's a big change effective January 1st, 2021 with regards to the Brown Act and social media. But there hasn't been a lot of cases or anything after that. However, so here is the effective change. Effective January 1st, 2021, the Brown Act authorizes individual board council commission members to engage in conversations with the public on an internet-based social media platform to answer questions, to provide information to the public, or even to solicit information from the public regarding a matter that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the body. However, a member of the legislative body shall not respond directly to any communication on that internet-based social media platform regarding any matter that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the body that is made posted or shared by any other member of the body. So to sum up all of that ver verbiage, you can directly communicate with the public about any subject matter jurisdiction within the, within, um, the city health commission. But if say Dr. Mandel posts an article on his, uh, on a social media platform, commissioner Sirota cannot respond to it. He can, he, he, you may, and this is where it gets iffy, you may forward that article, but you may not, and this is, this, and I, and I will expand on this, you may not respond verbally or even with a, you may not even use, and it applies to all communication. So you cannot um, verbally respond or type response, or you can't even use emojis, buttons, or reactions anymore at this point. Um, so obviously, just to, I'm sure everyone is aware, but what is an internet-based social media platform? It, it is basically your Twitters, your Instagrams, your LinkedIn's, your TikToks, um, anything that is open and accessible to the public, uh, that is sort of an internet-based platform. Uh, so you get, so at this point, I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a really interesting example. So if a commission member comments in response to a question posed by a member of the public, and then another commissioner likes that commissioner's response, that interaction is now a violation of the Brown Act. And not, and the question is, is Commissioner A or Commissioner B the person who is in violation of the Brown Act? Don't know yet. Great question. So it is, it, it, it seems that it used to be as long as there wasn't a quorum present on a social media platform, you could have discussions on social media platforms within the subject matter jurisdiction of a commission or counsel, that is no longer the case. It's just a response and it's any communication. Emoji, thumbs up, you know, anything. Um, one other issue that has been flagged too, and, my, and actually is interesting, I mean, it, it arose from litigation, but a lot of people are aware of what's going on with the city. Um, there was a case a few years ago called City of San Jose versus Superior Court that noted electronic communications on both an official's personal and governmental email accounts could be subject to the CPRA. Well, given what so now with social media, the social media posts now may be subject to CPRA requests as well for commissioners and council members. Um, so just be aware, uh, I mean, subject matter jurisdiction, that's why in a sense, if you're going to do commission business, do commission business using city email, not necessarily your own email. So if you're posting articles, 
I don't even know if, and this is something for me, I don't even know if the commissioners here have a, commi a city email. I'm, assu I'm assuming everyone does. Oh, we do great. Not. Okay. So we'll try, you know, we'll try to figure out how to work on that because I don't know every, I don't, you know, there are some commissions where the commissioners, and, and this is where they're, you know, where the commissioners do a lot of exchanging of articles and information. I, I don't know the purviews of this commission and whether it does that, but I wanted to make sure everyone understood the new rules just in case people are are doing that, uh, you know, are doing that. Um, so in a sense is if you have an article that you want sent out, it's almost like having it sent out from um, the city health commission. I don't even know if we have, we don't even have a website, but sent out from like Erica, sending it to Erica, letting Erica blast it out. And then you guys can blast it out from there, you know, but, but if, if commissioner Shannon, blast something out, and then Commissioner Mandel responds to it, violation. So that is the new rules. I feel like Bill Maher with the silly new rules um, because this, I think that this issue is draconian. Um, there has been, I didn't read the legislative uh, sessions as to why it is so draconian, um, but that is where we find ourselves. These small, I mean, not even an emoji. You can't even like, you can't even put a smiley face anymore on any, on any, on at least responding to another commissioner. And I see a hand up, uh, Commissioner Shannon. Yeah, so changes to the Brown Act would happen at the state legislative level, level correct? Correct. Legislature. Okay. So this could be clarified or maybe changed in the future because I think <laughs> I think everyone would agree that liking somebody's post um, first of all you don't have a quorum on that <laughs> um, or you're not violating it I think with one other person doing that although that's coming back to us if that's the case so we'll adhere to that um, but I think you know maybe there needs to be some policy changes at the state level um, just to make this um, a little more reasonable it, and it was a it was a change in what in AB nine nine two, um, and I think there must have been quite a bit of abuse with respect to a lot of communications between city council members of various city councils or commission or other groups on that were that people kept responding to a thread that ended up looking and being a. a theoretically a Brown Act violation. So they just basically said, we're not even gonna let people respond. So yeah, I agree with you. It, this is something that the state legislature, and you know, I've looked at all of, um, you know, a lot of uh, public interests or law firms that work with uh, municipalities and they've all commented on the draconian nature of this. So we'll see what happens. And there has not been as far as I've seen yet, there has not been any cases, and I have like a, a Google alert that gives me Brown Act updates every day at noon. So if anything happens, I will let you know. There has been slight, you know, there was slight movement on the other potential Brown Act issue, which is virtual meetings, um, that that is moving through the legislature uh, currently of whether virtual meetings are going to stay and right now, at least, there is no timetable for them to be off the table. Although I, I've been hearing maybe September, but I think now with potentially the you know Delta variant and other aspects, you know that may change. We don't know, but um, and I you know and there may be an option to allow for the option of having in-person and/or virtual meetings. But I will keep. On both issues, I will keep this commission updated, but I wanted to guys give you the the newest change to the Brown Act to make sure that nobody communicates in that way. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any questions? So I, have a, I have a separate question altogether. So go ahead. <laughs> for me or for the for? Oh, I just I'm going to be back east next meeting, which I hope. The question is, are we going to continue to do a Zoom meeting? Because I can do it from back east, but I can't do it from... Yeah, you know. for, for our next meeting, will be Zoom. 
Oh. And there is nothing at this point, there's no city policy, and the governor's directive still regarding virtual meetings is in effect. And according to the governor's office, they will give ample time to, to anyone when, they, when that policy changes. So I'm assuming they would give 60, at least 30 to 60 days to allow for changes to bring staff and bring, you know, because this does, if this affects city councils and city council staff all over the state, commissions, everything. So, okay. Um, what I would say, in regards to the the Brown Act, at least uh, during the time that I've been the president, uh, we've been very careful, and we never send anything out ourselves. We always go through the city clerk's office, um, and and have the clerk's office send something. Um, even in our workings on our report. Uh, we either have the uh, research associates slash interns um, reach out to individuals uh, or go through the city clerk so that we're, we're never having ourselves sending um, emails to um, individuals. Um, and if there is any conversation, we always make sure it's, it's uh, nowhere near uh, a violation of the Brown Act. So this commission is, is absolutely 100% phenomenal when it comes to that. I will tell you in the other... Uh, commission in the other groups, a lot of other groups that I've given this presentation to, I have titled this presentation, hate the message, don't hate the messenger, because, oh my goodness, do I just get ripped on this. I'm like, I didn't write it, but there are a lot of other commissions that communicate everything through social media and have incredibly active social media presence. So... For them, it's it's a violation, you know, in a sense for them of of of, cert, of other, you know, certain rights and stuff. So, you know, I, it's a ple it's a pleasure to know. I, I've never had any Brown Act issues with respect to communications here, and it's great. Trust me, you guys are the gold standard. <laughs> we're, we're, we're probably all. Uh, 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 respond to positive reinforcement. So uh, it's probably the part of our amygdala that was lighting up uh, when our, our uh, moms or dads patted us on our heads or <laughs> the hug for doing the right thing when we were three years old or something. Um, any other uh, uh, comments or discussions about the Brown Act or the changes? Um, seeing none, thank you very much, uh, Counselor. Uh, we respect your advice and, and uh, uh, opinions. Um, thank you for everything you do to make the commission work. Um, we could not uh, be as effective and efficient uh, without your, your wise counsel. Thank you. Um, seeing uh, no other business, um, is there a motion for adjournment? I think we're um, just for items for future discussion. I don't know if we're, we're working on it or not. And I know we've had some folks who've, who've come and talked to us about this, but I think with the you know rise of the Delta variant and cases now creeping up to numbers where we haven't seen since March, um, it might be nice to have someone come, uh, may, maybe a virologist or someone else who is keenly aware of, of what can kind of stun the tide. Not that we probably don't know some of these things, but um, if we can get someone along those lines to talk to us about that, I think it'd be beneficial since it's the most, um, you know, current and, and riskiest health problem that we have in, in Los Angeles uh, right this second. Yeah, I, I think that's, we could do that. Um, there's uh, uh, research people at Cedars, uh, one who uh, um, came to us uh, about seven months ago, I think it is, this whole covered year and a half, it's kind of blended together. Um, and I believe we could probably reach out to her. Um, one of her associates is also uh, an expert on the different subtypes. Um, there are some uh, CDC uh, individuals and other uh, virologists um, back east at Hopkins that are doing uh, analysis of, of, of Delta variant. Um, so potentially we could reach out to one of them as well. Um, so we could definitely um, uh, do that. Um, of interest, just you know, as long as we're discussing the Delta variant, um, the the current vaccine vaccines all work against the, the Delta variant, um, and um, 
the probability of catching the Delta variant if you've been um, um, properly vaccinated and end up uh, being in an ICU is four in 100,000. So it's a pretty small number, which is for the general public who's out there. And if you've not been vaccinated, please, please, it is easy to get vaccinated. It is, there, the three vaccines available here in Los Angeles are all safe, very, very effective. Um, and if you look at the slight bump in uh, numbers of cases and hospitalization, I think um, as of yesterday, there was uh, um, only 384 uh, people in hospitals in LA County um, because of COVID. Um, um, virtually all of those individuals uh, have not been vaccinated. So you can protect yourself um, uh, out there if you're the, in the general public. Uh, you can easily get vaccinated. If you're having a hard time, you don't know how to get vaccinated, uh, you can easily go to the website of the LA um, Department of Public Health uh, and it will give a link uh, which will tell you nearest vaccination. Um, the uh, main chain pharmacies can all do it. Um, the, the LA Unified School System has uh, vaccination available for the general public as well. Um, so it's out there. Um, Commissioner Cotto. Yes, um, at the May uh, commission meeting, um, for items for future discussion, I uh, brought up that uh, the Healthy Housing Foundation made a pledge uh, to house the homeless, $100 million. Uh, uh, it was an ad addressed to the mayor and the council. They wanted to fast track, I think, uh, new construction for low housing, uh, have city fees waived. And I asked if we could get either the, the mayor's office, uh, planning, the Department of Planning, or I don't know if it's the Office of Finance that handles these fees, uh, to respond to that to see whether it's a viable request uh, or not. And I haven't heard back or any progress on that. But uh, I'd like to bring that up again. Uh, we, we can look into that. I think we, we tried. There were several people that we reached out to, um, um, both in the county and the city, as well as some other um, experts to speak tonight. Tonight, um, and we uh, were not. They were not able to come today, and um, or haven't responded in the way that we'd want them to. We sent uh, several invitations to them, and they were non-responsive. But we can we can definitely work on that. But then also, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw the article, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, he's been wanting to help uh, with the homeless situation. He's talked to a lot of the different council members uh, and uh, is offering, you know, he wants to get a better feel. I think he's talking to the people that are working in the nonprofit and would also like to pledge money once he has a better idea of, uh, of how he can effectively help. Um, I don't know if we're shooting for the moon by, you know, having him come and present his ideas to us and how we can facilitate, you know, making recommendations to the council based on what he wants to do. But that would be another uh, recommendation for items for future discussion. Um, so I think if I recall, at least from the, 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 uh, the newspapers, um, he had met with several members of the city council. Um, I'm not sure if he met with the mayor, um, but it's possible, uh, Commissioner Cotto, that your um, uh, your city uh, council member has met with him. Yes, he has. So, you know what I'd ask you to do, um, if you could go through that. The commission president is frozen. So, at this point, so 
So I'm assuming he's asking me to go through the council office to see if they could get in touch and make the recommendation. Is that possible for the council office to make that request for him to contact the commission? Yeah, I think um, if I can interject here a little bit, um, I think first of all, for the Healthy Housing Foundation and Housing is Human Right, I think Matt Zabo, who's coming in as the new CAO, um, would probably be a good person to speak to the, the Health Commission. Um, so we should probably reach out to him um, and see if he can come and speak to us since he's coming in um, you know, as a new head of all these departments. Um, and I think uh, I have an avenue actually, um, I believe to Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, so I don't know if he would want to address the council as a whole um, or be willing to talk to our commission about um, what his ideas are. Um, but I think there are like a lot of people who are sort of moving um, in the same direction on this, which is building quicker. Um, and to get more value uh, for the volume that we need. And um, there are a lot of really great ideas out there. Um, so I think, you know, that would actually be a good topic and maybe to have a few speakers come and talk to us about this, um, as well as, you know, folks who are willing to fund it. Well, so we're the ones that make in our annual report the recommendations to the council. So. It would seem that if he would, you know, come and present his ideas. Uh, yeah. Know. And I would, I mean, I think for our next report, I would really like to focus on um, prefab modular housing and adaptive reuse um, and getting people into a lot of the already vacant departments. I think those are three things that I'd like to see in the future for us to focus on. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mandel just said that he got cut off and that he can't rejoin the meeting. All right. Well, I think we're we're pretty much at our end point here. Um, Can I move to adjourn the meeting? Yeah. Let's, can we get a second? Second. All right. Our meeting is now adjourned, everybody. We'll see you um, next month virtually. Bye-bye. Right, Thank All you. Right. Bye. Bye.